Claudia Lawrence was a 35-year-old chef from Hemworth, York, with a vibrant personality and a lust for life. However, on the 18th of March 2009, she disappeared without a trace. 14 years on, the police, alongside her family and friends, are still desperately searching for what may have happened to her. This is the very sad case of Claudia Lawrence. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today's case is one I want to cover because I genuinely feel when there are unsolved cases, we need to shed light on them. I don't do many of them because I always feel that there is a level of real sadness, that there is no closure, but equally I think it's really important to keep this kind of information out there so that people who might not know about Claudia Lawrence keep her memory alive and the new generations to come listen out and listen hard. Because for me, whoever harmed Claudia Lawrence, and I have no doubt whatsoever that she has been harmed. They are out there and they believe that they are going to get away with murder. But the truth is, time is not their friend. More and more we see cold cases grow very, very hot and eventually create a scenario where the person who is responsible for harming people becoming apprehended and then finally incarcerated. And we want this for Claudia Lawrence. That's why I've decided to cover this case. Also, Yes, the Chase merch has dropped. For those of you new to my channel and are thinking what's she on about, this is my cat, Chase. And you guys wanted some merch, so I thought I'd go for the Don't F*** With Cats merch because of course we all know how iconic that particular documentary was regarding true crime and armchair detectives and their incredible effectiveness. People like you solve crimes like this. Also, I want to say thank you to all of you coming back to my channel. I release my true crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. If you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Also, if you haven't subscribed, please do, if you like the content at least. Also, get your notifications on because I will be dropping additional episodes. So you'll have my consistent theme and you'll always get them on a Wednesday and a Sunday. But there will be extra editions dropped in both here on my main channel and on my YouTube membership and on Patreon. So look out for those. So let's talk about Claudia Lawrence. And also let's talk about how angry some of the things that have been said about her make me. Because I genuinely feel that there is an expectation of women that is not levied towards their male counterparts. And it will become clear as I talk about this case why my feelings exist on this. So let's look at Claudia Lawrence. She was born in Malton, North Yorkshire on the 27th of February, 1974. It's a lovely area. For those of you who don't know Malton, it's a really lovely area. She grew up in what would be considered a middle-class affluent experience. So her father, Peter, her mother, Joan, and her older sister, Ali, made up her family. Peter was a really prosperous solicitor and he was deeply good at his job, which will become clear by the end of this video. He's a very dedicated man and somebody that I think many of us would wish to have as a father ourselves. Joan, her mother, she was a member of Malton Town Council. She'd served as a mayor of the town. So we're talking about really upstanding individuals in their local community. And this clearly led to Claudia having a comfortable childhood as we would wish for her to experience. She ended up being privately educated at the York College for Girls, which is the prestigious place to be educated. Later down the line, she attended a local catering college and she qualified as a chef. I'm gonna imagine that Claudia, a little bit like me, didn't necessarily enjoy academia. So she decided that a love of food was gonna take her to the next level. And initially she's successful at working at several hotels and restaurants throughout York, but she became really tired of the unsocial hours. So the thing about being a chef, as I'm sure many of you know, is there's often an intensity 
hours wise and they're very unsocial hours because people are going out for their meals in the evening but also the wages are not particularly good unless you reach the very top most of us are not looking at a Gordon Ramsay style wage packet if we're a chef even Michelin starred chefs are not getting paid what you'd imagine they're getting paid and certainly if you are lower than those ranks and you are just going through the wheels of working in this kind of catering environment the chances are you are paid because you love food and not because you think you're going to make a fortune out of it so understandably she gets a little bit jaded by just how it chips into her social hours so in 2006 she gets the ideal job which is at the University of York's Goodrick College and she worked as a chef in the canteen on the university's main campus and immediately we can see that that's going to probably reduce those unsocial hours considerably and also it's that consistency I think there is something really positive about getting a job in educational establishment because usually have good pension plans, there are decent holidays, you are protected, there's a great HR department if anybody's hassling you. So the benefits genuinely outweigh the problems you might encounter when working in those establishments. We get to 2007 and this is when Claudia purchases a really lovely cottage in the York suburb of Hayworth. Now Hayworth is gorgeous, it's a really nice part of York. For those of you who don't live in the UK, you won't know what I'm on about regarding York, but it's gorgeous. It's just such a beautiful place to visit. If you go at Christmas in particular, it's just idyllic. And the actual countryside around York is incredible. And Hayworth is stunning. It's situated from about three miles from the university as well. So it's absolutely ideal. And what would I say about Claudia in that home? Well, she kept it very tidy, genuinely very very tidy she's clearly somebody with a little bit of a perfectionistic attitude to life because genuinely i've looked at the pictures of her home when she disappeared and she is somebody who kept order and i guess that when you're a chef you probably need to have that organization because it comes with the territory but certainly she's a great example of that claudia as an employee was considered really punctual she was considered very reliable by her employer as well so she had an excellent work record now, even though she's in her 30s at the time of her disappearance, she did remain single throughout her life, but it's said that she had a gregarious social life. And I think that on a convention level, people will look at women and still today imagine that something's gone wrong if you're not married in your 30s. But everybody has a different journey to go on. And I think there's something really powerful about a woman who decides that that's not for her, or maybe she wants a different kind of experience where relationships are concerned. But we still come from a society that has an expectation and a standard where women are concerned. And it is that ideally we should be pure, definitely be mothers, and also be loyal. And they are massively heavyweight ideas to throw against this gender, because it really isn't for everyone nor should it be. So even though she is single, she does have lots of relationships. She was reported to have engaged in what's known as a series of short-term relationships, and it was were apparently conducted at the same time. She was reported to have had a number of covert sexual relationships with men, some of whom were married or in relationships. So this is out there for everyone to see and read about and it's also my bugbear where this story is concerned which we'll go into deeper detail on shortly but who you hang out with in your private life is your private business as simple as that and the idea that we are all being really open about what we've got on within our private lives is bs lots of us don't want our friends and family to know what's going on behind closed doors. Listen, in psychology, and I've been in this field for 20 years, I often work with people with paraphilias who are particularly engaged in sexual practices that other people would not be okay with, certainly not the mothers, right? They're not doing anything harmful to other people. I'm saying it's just a little bit left field. It's just a bit a little bit kink orientated to the degree where they would not be comfortable with even their closest friends being aware of what gets them off. And there is nothing wrong with that human being. I know that we talk about paraphilia when it's extreme, like sadistic paraphilias, but what I'm talking about is those mainstream ones, like the BDSMs of this world, where there is a kink involved or a particular role play type. And these individuals don't want people to know outside of their individual knowledge and the person that they're involved with or the group they're involved with because they know about the judgments of society. Is that person a bad person? No. 
not under any universe. And the problem is, when we start looking at people and having an expectation of how people should act like in relationships, we are giving them an opportunity to fail and fall short. But they didn't even know they were in the competition. They didn't know that they were about to be judged harshly in this way. And the Claudia Lawrence case absolutely examples this. So for example, the fact that we know that she was involved in covert sexual relationships with men who were married. Well, she wasn't married. Now, you can get your judgy cap on. And believe me, I'm the queen of judge. We do know that. I'm judgy a lot of the time about certain situations. Is it ideal? that Claudia Lawrence is involved with married men? No. Ideally, you should be involved with single men. Is it Claudia Lawrence's problem that those men are married? No, it's the men's problem. At the end of the day, they're the ones who are playing away from home. And we don't even know the details of who or why. And the idea that people are having affairs because everything's hunky-dory at home just doesn't ring true at all. So I genuinely feel it's a massive problem when we start taking apart the pieces of the puzzle without knowing the full picture. And this is what's happened in the Claudia Lawrence case. So she may have had multiple partners. So what? Genuinely, it feels like people want to look at her life and say, we wanted her to be this picture perfect individual who didn't have anything in her background that's a little bit salacious. Well, you know what? Most human beings have something relatively salacious or secretive within their lives that we don't want people to know about. It's just, our lives. And for the most part, no one's going to find out about that stuff. And the only time that these kind of things play out in the public is when horrible things like this that I'm talking about today occur, such as Claudia Lawrence disappearing. Now, Claudia Lawrence, she was very discreet about these relationships. Her family didn't know very much about the relationships with these guys. And this, I would say, becomes one of the biggest bugbears for me, and I'm sure anybody in the true crime field, when you look at how the media play into the speculation around her private life. Because the problem is, when these kind of things happen, it influences the police investigation, and it also influences the perception of the public towards an individual who's gone missing, and that's a big issue. It's exactly the same when I cover cases where sex workers disappear, or where sex workers are murdered, and there is this idea in the general public that they were kind of asking for it, which is ludicrous. You should be able to go where you want, do what you want, act how you want without those consequences. I'm just setting that up now. We'll explore it in a little bit more detail, but it is very upsetting that I think Claudia Lawrence's case has been drowned to some degree in the salacious content that the MSM wanted to levy against it to make it more interesting for them to write about as opposed to thinking about what the main aim is, which is to figure out what the hell happened to Claudia Lawrence. So after she's moved to Hayworth in 2007, she gets involved in the local community and she starts frequenting a pub called the Nags Head. That's quite close to home. Great, she's a young woman. She wants to go out and have a drink and she wants friends. It's almost like in this case, people are like, you're never gonna guess. What? Claudia Lawrence has disappeared. Oh, hang on a minute. Claudia Lawrence. Yeah. Claudia Lawrence from the Nags Head Inn. Yeah, that Claudia. Oh, Claudia Lawrence, the girl who drinks alcohol. Oh, don't even get me started on the devil's juice, Jan. She's been seen to partake. I agree. Well, I've heard that she spoke to the male gender. Oh, now that's something I haven't heard. A woman in her 30s going for a drink in a bar or a pub, speaking to the male gender, drinking alcohol. All those things are true. What could she expect but to disappear? It's obvious. Everybody knows. If you're a woman and you go to a pub and you have a drink with friends or without, it's definitely likely you'll end up dead. That's genuinely how it felt in this case. I'm just throwing it out there. You may know I feel a little bit triggered. Anyway, she goes to this Nags Head pub, which is, as I said, close to her home. And she apparently starts relationships with a few men that she meets fast drinking, like so many people do. And if this was a man, would we even be having this conversation? And her dad did say, look, on reflection, some of the liaisons had created some awkward situations with her lovers because 
I imagine that they had partners at times and understandably those partners are not going to be thrilled when they find out that their men are hanging out with a young woman and a young attractive woman as Claudia was, particularly if they're a few decades older and having some kind of intimate relationship with her. That makes sense. Nobody enjoys finding out that your partner's playing away from home. She also was somebody who apparently loved travel and she had a particular love for Cyprus and I love Coral Bay, which is one of the places that she absolutely adored. It's gorgeous and the Cypriot people are amazing. And she'd actually been out there and tried to explore potential job opportunities. One of her friends said, wherever we went, Claudia was somebody that people just warmed to. And she was somebody that essentially would get into a conversation to almost create options. And there was one particular occasion where she was constantly offered a job as a chef in a bar when she was out there. So it feels like she had some ambitions and big dreams and they didn't necessarily place her in the UK. And again, that says something about her nature, doesn't it? We've got a young woman who was brought up in a very middle-class environment. She had the trappings of middle-class life and education, but she's kind of gone down a different route and she hasn't got married. She hasn't had kids. She's obviously enjoying being valued as a sexual object in certain men's eyes and enjoying that connection without having to commit but she's looking at the world as a bigger picture in place. So part of the reason she hasn't potentially put down absolute links in the UK, i.e. with a partner or with a family, is because she's thinking about bigger picture and wider horizons of traveling. So Claudia Lawrence, to all intents and purposes, is living an excellent life. She's having fun. She's got some really good friends, two very, very close friends in particular. She's holidaying. She's got a great relationship with people at work. She's deeply cared for by her family, everything is going well. So let's get to what we're talking about today, when Claudia disappears, essentially. So let's talk about her last known whereabouts first off. So 6 a.m. Wednesday the 18th of March 2009, Claudia Lawrence starts her shift at Goodrick College's Roger Kirk Centre. And actually one of her colleagues noticed that she looked a little bit the worse for wear and they kind of raised this with her and she said, oh yeah, she'd had quite a heavy night, but we've all been there. There'll be people out there saying, I have never touched even a drop of alcohol in my life, nor have I been near any recreational drugs. I have no idea why I did a, what seems to be a deep South accent there, it just came out. <laughs> Apologies, maybe it's because in my brain, I associate some kind of Bible bell with it. Anyway, that's by the by. The point is, most of us, I have, without a doubt, certainly when I was considerably younger, turned in for work feeling that I may die by 11am. And actually considering seriously whether I should invest in some kind of funeral plan because it felt imminent, my death. So she's had one of those nights, but we don't know what went on. She's just saying that she had a heavy night. She could have been by herself, drinking gin, watching some kind of really sad film. She could have been having fun with some married guy, who cares? It's her life, she can do what she wants. But she's noted that this has been a heavy night. We get to 2 p.m. and at this point she's completed a shift and this means because there's CCTV on the campus, they actually can see her leaving the college on foot a few minutes later, everything's okay. Then at 3 p.m. she's recorded on CCTV passing a shop that's in Melrose Gate, which is really near her home. She's actually also seen by a neighbour at this point. And then during the evening, we know that she was still alive and well because she's chatting away to her dad and to her mum on a mobile. And her mother actually described Claudia's mood as being really normal, being really relaxed. And there was actually a forthcoming Mother's Day, which meant that they were talking about what celebrations they might have on Mother's Day and for that Mother's Day. It was completely typical. There was nothing untoward. She didn't sound anxious. She wasn't depressed. She wasn't talking about feeling unfulfilled in her life. There are those conversations that people have retrospectively often when somebody goes missing and let's say, for example, they take their own life or they go missing and they turn up years down the line. It tends to, when they track back in the conversations, there'll be flags that if you had put them all together in the moment, would have said, this person's in distress, this person's depressed, this person's struggling. But because they are spattered throughout the conversations, you don't necessarily do that detective work until after that person disappears. But with Claudia Lawrence, there are none. There are no big red flags. She's not talking about being unhappy. She's not talking about hating a job. 
She's not talking about not wanting to be present in the UK. She's not talking about anything that will make you feel that there is something going on in the background of her world alive where she wishes to escape or where she is struggling with her mental health. It's just totally typical. So Claudia told her mum that she was at home and that she basically planned to go to bed early because, of course, she got up quite early for work. She'd need to be up at 5 a.m., to walk to work the next day because her car was being repaired. And her mother said, one of the things that's really upsetting is that she did offer Claudia the taxi money, but Claudia didn't want the taxi money. And again, that introduces us to the concept that Claudia wasn't concerned for her life. She wasn't imagining there was some stalker after her. She wasn't fearing that there was some kind of man in a relationship with her that was coming chasing after her and that she had to be concerned and make sure that she was transported safely. That's not what is going on. It also means that she felt safe walking to work. So ultimately, again, that frames the idea that Claudia is going about her moments and movements completely normally. She is not at risk in her mind. We get to 8.23 p.m., at this point, she sends a final text message from a phone and that friend who received that text message did actually return a message at 9.12 p.m. and she didn't receive a reply to that text. So essentially what that says is that nobody heard from Claudia after 8.23 p.m. that night. Now, it's likely that she went to bed because understandably she's getting up at five o'clock in the morning. You can see that going to bed at maybe nine is going to be what most of us would do. Arguably, you could also say it's strange that she didn't necessarily respond to that friend who got in touch at 9, 12 p.m. Because she might have been asleep at that point, but I don't know about you guys. And again, this is me talking about my personal habits and my personal habits do not necessarily extend to the world. My habits are not necessarily the rest of the world's habits. But you bet your bottom dollar, if I wake up in the morning and I look at a text message that I received the night before that I haven't responded to, I am going to respond to it, particularly if I'm going walking to work. I've got time to do that, but that didn't happen. So nobody knows what happened to Claudia after that text was sent, essentially. We get to Thursday, the 19th of March, 2009. This is when Claudia is scheduled to start work. She would usually start work at 6 a.m. She doesn't turn up for her shift. Now, it seems as if she has some really good relationships at work and understandably it's protocol that if somebody doesn't turn in for their shift, you're going to be like, hmm, why is Claudia not here? There are sausages to be made. So understandably, he calls her mobile phone. Now, the phone did ring, but the call was directed to voicemail. So we know that her phone was on and charged at that point. Her manager didn't actually take any further action because what can you do? Somebody hasn't turned in for work. You imagine they're going to crawl in with a tail between their legs, apologising the next day. Maybe they're sick, etc. It's not totally unusual for this to happen. Now, aside from Claudia not turning into work, she'd also arranged to meet her friend Susie Cooper at the Nag's Head that night. So Susie goes to that pub, but Claudia never shows up. Now, understandably, her friend's thinking, why are you not here? I want to hang out with you. And also, how rude, because that's how we are when our friends don't turn up, particularly when we've not been given any advice or guidance that they're not going to be present. So Susie does try to ring her, and apparently Claudia was literally always on her phone. Again, that's another indicator for me that it's strange she didn't respond to the message that she got the night before, the morning that she woke up, if she had capacity to do so, why wouldn't she have done so? Because apparently, as Susie said, she's always on her phone. So at this point, Susie's a little bit concerned because she doesn't get any response and Claudia doesn't turn up. So then Susie once again attempts to contact her the following morning. This is Friday, March the 20th. Again, no success. So she's really concerned at this point. Yeah, she put down the night before potentially to her just not feeling well or maybe being engaged in other situations. She was probably a bit annoyed at the onset, but now it's the next day and she still can't contact her. She's thinking, this is not like Claudia at all. She's really responsible. She would get back to me. So Susie, being a great friend, starts contacting mutual acquaintances. So she speaks to George Foreman, who's the landlord of the Nags Head, because 
asks him, do you have any information that people are telling you about where she might be? He's got access to a big social network because they're coming to the pub. And because Susie and Claudia actually frequent the pub, understandably, there will be people who know the both of them. So it's a good place to start. So George Foreman is basically asked, can you figure out whether anybody knows where she is? Susie then goes further and she actually speaks to Claudia's dad. This is a really great friend, isn't it? At the end of the day, somebody who's going out of their way to not just feel concerned, but to act on that concern. And when you think about the importance that time has in missing person scenarios, this is so key. And also, even if somebody is badly injured or can't get help because they've become incapacitated, you need people like Susie in your life, don't you? So she speaks to Claudia's dad and tells him what's going on and that she's really concerned. So Peter then speaks to Claudia's employer. So he speaks to the manager at Goodrick College and that manager says, listen, she didn't come in for work duty on either the 19th or 20th of March. So now they are frantic. So initially Peter and George Foreman from the pub goes to Claudia's house and they enter using a spare key. What's notable is that the house looks as they'd expect. So it's fairly clean. The bed had been made. There were unwashed dishes in the kitchen sink. It suggested that she'd had toast for breakfast. And when they're looking around, it doesn't look like she's been involved in a struggle. So it looks as if she's walked out of that home potentially of her own volition. They do notice that her handbag was there and that handbag contained her purse, her bank cards, and they also found that her passport was still in the house. I guess that we could analyse this a little bit. First off, I think it's quite unusual to leave your bank cards in the home. I'm going to assume from the information and data that I've got that she maybe had multiple bank cards and would have only required one. That's the case in my house. I only ever take one bank card out with me. The rest are at home. So even though it seems strange that bank cards would be present, I would imagine that would be the reason behind it. Also, you don't take your passport with you unless you're traveling. So that would indicate that she wasn't leaving the country. And she has essentially, as far as they're concerned, taken a mobile phone and she would often be seen with a rucksack. So it's likely that she had her going to work rucksack and she had her handbag at home with other possessions in it doesn't mean that she didn't have access to money with a card that she would have carried to work and who knows she might have left all her bank cards at home because she only ever ate at work and that probably didn't cost her any money and she wasn't imagining that she needed to buy anything on the way home but ultimately they're not that concerned at looking at those items that suddenly she's become somebody who's fleeing from the country because her passport is present and she's not taken all of the things that would give her access to money they could only note the things that were missing in the house of any significance anyway, were her mobile phone, also a set of hair straighteners, and also a rucksack, which as I said, she usually carried to work because she'd have a chef's whites in there and she'd carry them to work, put them on and then take them off when she was going home from work. So all this indicates essentially that Lawrence had left the house as usual to go to work at around 5 a.m. on the morning of the 19th of March, but essentially had never arrived. Unless, of course, something had happened to Claudia the night before and the person had time to manage the situation and to suggest by using certain props like a plate from breakfast and a made bed that she had left of her own volition. We have to bring that in as a possibility. Yes, there wasn't a struggle, at least they didn't know that a struggle had taken place, but again, that would suggest that there'd been a violent attack, and we all know that not all murders are carried out in a violent way. You can do it quite quietly with things like drugs or suffocation while somebody is drugged. I'm not saying that happened, by the way. I'm just saying that we can't always look at a house and go, ultimately, this person left the house of their own volition. It doesn't always work out that way, particularly if you've got somebody who's quite sophisticated in wanting to make somebody disappear, particularly if they have a reason to make somebody disappear because that person has information about their private life, potentially, that they're not happy with. And like I said, if you happen to be in some kind of relationship with an individual and they know things about your other relationships that you don't want your other relationships to find out about and you want to get rid of them, well, you're not going to act like you have a problem with them because you want to get access 
to who they are and their situation at home so that you can basically go ahead and do whatever you need to do to make them disappear. And it could be, I'm just posing it, potentially that somebody was invited in happily by Claudia Lawrence and she just never got to leave that address alive again. Not saying it happened, I'm just saying we should always look at every stone being unturned essentially. We get to the 20th of March at 2pm. At this point, North Yorkshire police were contacted and when she's reported missing, they take it seriously. I would say in the press, there is a lot of suggestions that the initial reaction was quite lacklustre. That's not what her father says occurred. He said that they did take it seriously. So it's worth noting that the Yorkshire Police Department who actually went and saw her father are not a big department. You know, there aren't lots of officers available. It's not like in London where you've got tens of thousands of police officers. We're talking about just count on one hand a lot of the departments numbers wise. So it's not that easy to drop everything and deal with a missing person situation. You have to draft people in. Now they do arrive quite quickly when her father said that she isn't present and he's worried about that and the police take the information down. And I would say there is some reticence to take it as seriously as we would ideally like them to. I always find it strange that the police want to believe that the best has happened, i.e. somebody's just gone off by themselves and is gonna come home. Because genuinely, if somebody's telling you, this is out of character for my child, this is out of character according to her friends, nobody's seen her, etc. She hasn't responded to the phone messages that have been sent, the calls. You know, that says there is something very likely sinister about what's played out or that that person is in trouble to some degree and it should require immediate action. But they figure out in their minds that Claudia isn't a vulnerable person, there's no obvious signs of violence and they think, you know what, she's probably just gone off for a few days and she'll reappear after a few days. I'm like, are you actually insane? No, we're not insane, that's what we believe. You are saying to me, that somebody who is entirely reliable in their job, who is literally considered by some of her friends as the best friend they've ever had for her loyalty, her commitment, her dedication, and her connection to them, you are saying, she's just gone off for a few days. That's exactly what we're saying. I think Claudia's just gone off for a few days. No one with any empathy or any connectedness to the people that they truly love act that way. Literally, she's walked out of her home if we're going down the lines of that she's left of her own volition, having ate breakfast, taken her rucksack and a phone with an absolute mindset of getting to work. But you think that probably as she's done that, oh, I'm just gonna, just gonna walk down to work, got my chef's whites, I'm all ready and um, ooh, What's that rave in London? I think I'll just pop down and go and do that for a few days, not informing my employer or friends or family. Yeah, we're saying that that is the most obvious theory that we can pose right now. Honestly, her dad's actually really nice when he comments about the police, but I would be devastated if that was the reaction by the authorities. But this is what they think, that maybe she's ran away, She's going to just magically reappear after a few days, even though we know the first 24 hours of somebody's disappearance is particularly important. In fact, the first hours is essentially important if we are going to solve a case and hope to find a perpetrator in many cases. Now, the North Yorkshire police officers on the case checked her route to work and also sent out a public request for information. But Claudia's family are becoming increasingly horrified by the lack of action, essentially. They feel from the immediacy of this situation playing out that she's been abducted. They're like, we know our daughter. We know our friend. She's not the kind of person who would just up and leave without any suggestion of contacting a family or a friend member so that we knew that she was safe. We know that she has, without a doubt, come to some harm and you're not acting on that. Now, after five weeks, five weeks, I kid you not, those few days were quite a few weeks of her just going off and having a bit of fun. Yeah, it does seem that way now. Five weeks. How long it took before North Yorkshire Police upgraded the inquiry from a missing person to one of suspected murder? And I appreciate that's because they're doing the investigating. That's because they're coming to that conclusion. But can you imagine for the family, they're like, we knew this from the get-go. We knew that the likelihood was, as far as we're concerned, she has come to harm. She's probably been abducted. Now, the case progress was challenging. 
So the original investigation, what they did was look at the range of possibilities as we would imagine. So first of all, they thought maybe Claudia had left with a new lover or that she'd gone indeed to take that break, wherever it was they thought that she'd taken that break. But as the family is getting more insistent that she would absolutely have contacted them, the idea of her just going off of her own volition and having a bit of fun, that gets dismissed, even though it should have been dismissed within the first, I don't know, six minutes. Then they considered, well, okay, maybe she had an accident, maybe she had a medical emergency on her way to work, and they're checking that route to check where she may have been, and of course they realise, well, no, because we've checked all the routes that she would have gone to work, and she wasn't there, and she's not in the hospitals, there's no trace of her, therefore we can't carry on with that line of inquiry. Another one was that Claudia had actually been the victim of a chance encounter with a serial killer or another crazed individual, and there were actually reports made of people who were behaving strangely in the Hayworth area in the days leading up to Lawrence's disappearance. So there was CCTV where there's a guy acting strangely in the days before Claudia Lawrence disappeared. But these reports were essentially investigated, but they didn't give any kind of conclusive results. So it's deeply frustrating because Claudia has disappeared. No one knows where she is and no one's being brought in for questioning. And literally they are not making any progress. And understandably, another theory that's posed is that Claudia's been the victim of a person that's known to her. So criminal profilers come in and they suspect that Claudia actually knows her attacker and they believed that her personal life held the clue to her disappearance. And we've got to be real about murder. Most of us, if we're murdered, know our killer. It's a sad reality, but it's true. So it doesn't seem left field to suggest that maybe there was some connection with her and the person who decided to kill her. So one critical piece of information that I find really disturbing, quite sinister in nature, is that Claudia's phone remained on until 10 past 12 p.m. on the 19th of March. So that's the day that we know she's disappeared. We don't know whether she could have disappeared in the night, but arguably somebody has her phone. So that phone doesn't get switched off deliberately, by the way, until 10 past 12 p.m. on the 19th of March. That's really concerning, isn't it? Somebody has purposefully switched that phone off and you can bet your bottom dollar it isn't Claudia. And it was determined that that phone had actually been connected to a mast in the Hayworth areas of York throughout the morning of 19th of March and up to the point it was actually switched off. So somebody physically switched it off. We know that the phone didn't leave the local area. And again, the reason that feels really sinister is if I think about somebody purposefully and willfully disposing of a body or of items belonging to that body, you can imagine them going through those motions, can't you, of actually purposefully and willfully switching it off. Now, the only CCTV camera on Claudia's most direct route to work was at the Melrose Gate post office and the recording from the morning of 19th of March did not show Claudia passing it. But... It doesn't seem like this is entirely critical because she could have passed out of the camera's view or she could essentially have used a parallel street. So it could just be that it didn't capture her. Now, Crime Stoppers do get involved and they start offering a reward of £10,000 to anyone who would basically provide any leads to the arrest and conviction of anyone who might be linked to the disappearance. And the police actually received 1,200 calls offering information after this plea. Also, there's an appeal made by John Setamu, who's the Archbishop of York. This is in early June 2009. And they also do a appeal on BBC One's Crime Watch. It's a really excellent programme in the UK. A lot of crimes are solved because Crime Watch do these reconstructions. And that's what they do with Claude. They do this reconstruction of her last known movements. And then 100 days after Claudia goes missing, her dad, Peter Lawrence, launches a YouTube appeal for information. And her dad all the way up until his death in 2021. It's really sad that Peter Lawrence has never had his answers because this man campaigned ceaselessly because he wanted his daughter's killer brought to justice. He wanted closure and it's so sad that he'll never be given that. I'm sure he knows now because he's in a completely different dimension. But at the point of his death, he had worked so hard to keep her image, to keep her voice to some degree in the public domain. And he was so committed to finding out exactly what happened to Claudia. So he starts this YouTube appeal for information. 
Then in late 2009, the, the Yorkshire Police and Claudia's family, they used the annual Whitby Regatta in North Yorkshire to publicise the campaign. So they are really working hard to keep her name alive in the public and press. Now, in September 2009, the North Yorkshire Police revealed that they've actually extended their search to Cyprus. So Detective Superintendent Ray Galloway stated that Claudia knew several people who lived on the island and that she may have received job offers whilst there. Yes! Superintendent Ray Galloway. She may well have, but she hadn't gone. She was still going to work that day, just throwing it out there. I don't think anyone is just like that impetuous when they've got a home and friends and family and everything's fine to just be like, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave my passport at home and go and take that job that I was randomly offered last summer. Oh, anyway, but this is one of the lines of inquiry. And another thing that the superintendent said was that people who'd been interviewed had been reluctant and less than candid when spoken to, and also that a team of officers had been sent to Cyprus to interview people whom Claudia had met there. But we have to remember, a lot of the men who may have been enjoying some private time with Claudia are going to be less than candid if they're having sex with her and they happen to be married. Like, you don't want your private information out there if it's going to affect your relationships. And I know that you shouldn't be doing it, but I get it. So it's not necessarily that they're holding back. They probably just don't want to go into the details about what they were doing with Claudia. And again, let's put this into context. She has the right to do what she wishes and not be judged. She was single. And it was reported that the last text message that she received was actually sent by a man from Cyprus. So there is communication there, but that doesn't feel very relevant, does it? Aside from the fact that she didn't get back to that friend. That's the only thing that's relevant. She didn't get back to them, even though she'd woken up in the morning, had a phone, was apparently attached to it and made breakfast and still didn't respond. Although arguably we could say, well, we don't know what the message was. Maybe it was complex and that's why she didn't respond. Maybe she hadn't got an answer for that person. She was letting it digest. So that could be a reason as well. Then later in the same year in the September, detectives make a search of an area of the University of York campus, but they don't turn anything up. We then get to October 2009, and it's at this point that the police reveal that they were looking for a driver of a rusty white van. So basically, there was a woman who reported that this guy had been basically hassling women walking past, trying to talk to women whilst he was parked, and that people were being made to feel very uncomfortable by this driver. In fact, one woman was convinced that there was something really malevolent about him, and it was on the route to... Claudia's work, and this happened in the days before she disappeared. So understandably, that rings as something that should be suspicious over, particularly if a guy's making women feel uncomfortable. We get to the 24th of March, 2010. At this point, the police start searching areas of Heslington in York, and the reason for that is they've received this new information. So they go ahead and they basically start searching land, which is near to a children's play area, which is basically near this muddy farm track, and they go ahead and search there. And then they relocate that search on the 25th of March to a field near the university, and there's this area of land bordered by the playing field and the university accommodation. But unfortunately, and very frustratingly, there's literally nothing of significance that gets discovered. And that search itself is later considered to have been a hoax. So a guy called Richard O'Rourke, who got jailed for 18 months, apparently led that hoax. It's mind-blowing that people exist like that, isn't it? It's my... When do you get that kind of thought? You know, oh, God, it's a... It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. I could watch Homes Under the Hammer. Maybe go for a run. Maybe ring my mum. But you know what I think I'll do today? I think I'll just call the police and uh, create an elaborate hoax regarding the Claudia Lawrence disappearance. That feels like a completely normal trajectory of behaviour, said nobody ever. Richard, you definitely need some serious help and therapy. And also, like, how cruel? The cruelty level of people who go ahead and do those things is immeasurable. Because you're talking about a family who love Claudia desperately. You're talking about friends who love her desperately. A community who really miss her presence in that community. And you have people like Richard O'Rourke just creating complete lies 
and costing money and devastating family members. Now, the same superintendent, Galloway, indicated that as far as they were concerned, the probable explanation for Claudia's disappearance lay in her lifestyle. And this is where me and Galloway are going to have a bit of an issue. Not going to lie. So yeah, apparently the reason that she disappeared was that she had this complexity in her life, this mystery, these relationships with the men. Because we all know, if you're the kind of person who, God forbid, has an affair, or indeed has more than one partner, you're pretty much guaranteed to be murdered. So anyway, that's what Galloway may as well have said. And it is disturbing to me. It is disturbing on a range of levels and factors. The idea that what Claudia Lawrence was doing in her bedroom is the reason that she's dead is insane. Genuinely. But yeah, apparently because, you know, she had this complexity and mystery quote of these relationships with men, that's probably why she disappeared. Meaning as well that all the guys that she was speaking to, and this is an intelligent, motivated, clever human being. Claudia is one of those people who had succeeded in her life. She may have done it atypically to what other people think is the right route, but she had done well. The idea that she's just surrounding herself with these really dodgy kind of people who might just kill her makes no sense. She had very close friends. And I know that we keep things from those closest to us. I appreciate it. But it's quite difficult to balance such complexity that we're talking about here that Galloway is trying to suggest she engaged with him. Also, in September of 2010, a guy called Rodney Bollard, who was 66 at the time, he was from Nottingham, he was reported to the police for harassment of the Lawrence family because he basically claimed to be a psychic and posted a sketch of the moment he claims that Claudia was murdered on his website. And he also was apparently responsible for laying a wreath at her home each Christmas, so that's not creepy. It's just what you want, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a psychic. Oh God, are you? Yeah, I'm not really sure. No, I am. I'm a psychic. I'm a psychic and I know exactly what happened to your daughter. Okay, that's interesting because the police have been investigating it for quite a while and they don't... Yeah, I know. But what they need is my sketch. Oh, what's this? Sketch. Do, is, that, is that a sketch of somebody killing my daughter? It is. It's a, it's a very good sketch. I'm very good. By the way, where do I put this wreath? Honestly, not helpful. I appreciate that psychics can be useful in certain circumstances, but not if the family don't want you involved. So, the investigation at this point starts to centre around this construction of a rogues gallery of the men that she'd been involved with. And it will go without saying that rogues probably is an inappropriate term because arguably just because she's seeing guys who might be in relationships doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad people. And it's really unhelpful to use that kind of terminology because again, it distorts the reality of what we're talking about. We're talking about a woman who has disappeared and is presumed murdered. So it worries me when people start using this kind of terminology. And there was one Sky journalist who actually said, Claudia apparently lived a significant part of her life in secret. For a privately educated daughter or a country solicitor, Claudia had some unusual acquaintances and this remains the only missing persons case where I've been warned off or threatened not once but twice. Well let me tell you Mr Sky journalist number one you ain't doing your job very well if you haven't been warned off more than once or twice on a lot of things because let me tell you you guys are intrusive. I work for the mainstream media, I present crime shows, I write, I know how intrusive you guys are. Actually, sometimes you just make shit up. So the idea that when you are trying to have conversations, probably with married men, about somebody who's gone missing, that people are saying, stay away from me, or I don't know, something bad might happen to you, which is, yeah, threatening, but is also contextual and understood in situations like this to take place, because you're protective of your family, you don't want them knowing, that is not something that suggests that these individuals are rogues or dangerous. It probably just suggests that you got your nose a little bit too in there and you're a journalist, not a copper. So I'm just gonna throw it in there. The fact that these kind of statements are made are genuinely not that helpful when it comes down to somebody like Claudia Lawrence, who's already being painted as some kind of scarlet woman, which she was not. Nobody has a right to know anything about your private life. It's your private life. 
And the fact that the police are out there basically going, oh, well, you know, she disappeared because she had all these complexities and all these men and they were a problem and that's probably why she's dead. So she kind of deserved it. And I know that that's not what they're saying, but I'm telling you, that's where it's landing. And when it lands with the public in that way, what happens is they switch off. Ah, oh, well, this won't happen to me because I don't do what she was doing. That's the key. We have a bias of security in our lives. We want to believe that there is reason why somebody would go missing. We don't want to think that we could walk to work one day and get brutally murdered. And it switches us off from the reality, which is that happens. It happens to nuns and it happens to sex workers because serial killers, rapists and murderers aren't necessarily looking at your background and lifestyle. They're looking at opportunity and a victim profile. So like I said, I have a real issue with the way that Claudia has been discussed about in the press and the way that they have switched onto her sex life and relationship life, as opposed to concentrating on the fact that the likelihood is she was abducted and murdered. Now in July, 2013, one of the things that they announced was they were gonna look at several stalled cases and that included Claudia Lawrence's disappearance, which must've been a real relief to the community and obviously to her family who had been trying their best to keep this alive. They carried out new forensic searches on Claudia's home on Hayworth Road. And at this point, they started to use techniques that basically weren't available in 2009. I mean, we all know that DNA is moving on massively and forensic investigations are getting better. And they did actually turn up some additional fingerprints and also a man's DNA on a cigarette end in her car. Although, let's be honest, a lot of us have friends who potentially back then would have smoked and just because somebody has DNA on the end of a cigarette doesn't mean that they've done anything to you. They were also able to find out that her mobile phone had showed cell activity that she basically spent time in the Acom area of York in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. And I guess that means that there was a potential she was seeing someone in that area. But again, that's not suggesting that she was involved with anybody in an untoward way. But again, I'm sure that many of us date people in different areas and it might not last, but clearly we'd spend time around that area because we have some kind of connection. And it certainly doesn't mean that somebody from Acom was responsible for her disappearance. Now on the fifth anniversary of Claudia's disappearance, a new appeal is made on Crime Watch on the 19th of March, 2014. And CCTV footage that was recovered in 2009 actually shows a really strange bit of footage. But don't get me wrong, again, it doesn't mean that there is anything untoward happening, but I've watched it a few times to try to garner my thoughts on it. And you do see this silver Ford Focus hatchback car, and it had been manufactured between 1998 and 2004, driving along Hayworth Road. And then all of a sudden, the car's brake lights come on as it approaches level with Lawrence's cottage. Now again, I've not investigated this, and this could be completely innocent. Two things occurred to me when I watched it. I thought, what if they were slamming on the brakes because they hit Claudia? What if she was crossing and got hit? Or what if someone had been in her home and done something to her and then needed to get her body from the property? Again, I'm not saying that that's what happened. I'm just saying I found it quite strange when I watched the way that those brake lights come on and it kind of screeches, I would imagine, to a stop. Now, the new investigation into Claudia Lawrence's disappearance was led by Detective Di Malin, and they did actually make quite a number of arrests. So on the 13th of May, 2014, a 59-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of a murder. He basically lived quite close to her home. He'd been a colleague at the University of York. Apparently, he was on really friendly terms. He'd often given her lifts in his car to and from work. They then had a warrant to go and search his house in York and his mother's house in North Shields in Tyneside. He was released on bail the following day and there were no charges actually brought. Then in July 2014, police arrested Paul Harris. Now, Paul Harris was the landlord of the Acombe pub. Now, this has now been renamed the Clockhouse pub. The reason for that was there was a suggestion that he perverted the course of justice, but again, he was quickly released without charge. He stated that Claudia had been a customer at his pub in the week before she disappeared and that he had spoken to her, but he said, that is my only connection. There's no other relationship between us. That's how I know her. She frequents the pub. 
Then in 2015, the January of that year, Daniel Oxley, who was 22 at the time, he was jailed for life for murdering a man in County Durham. Now, during his arrest, he actually said he'd murdered Claudia Lawrence, but his barrister said that Daniel Oxley was basically attention-seeking and was being grandiose and basically wanted to act in this way to misrepresent his own position to seem a little bit more tougher and rougher than he potentially was. Equally, if you're the barrister of somebody that you're defending and they're like, I did this, you're like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, no, you didn't. You didn't do that. Shut up. Do you not understand the words no comment? But again, I'm sure that that was investigated and I'm sure that it's come to nothing because it didn't have any connection. Detective Superintendent Di Malin also makes them go over their old steps. So they do new searches in the alleyway behind Claudia Lawrence's home in Hayworth, but nothing's found that's significant. And the detective who's heading this at this point, the detective superintendent says, you know what, one of the biggest problems that we've got are liars. People aren't telling us the truth. They said, I am convinced and I know people have lied to us. I hope they realise the pain the family is going through. Then in April of that year, three more men are arrested. They're all in the 50s at the time. And again, this is on suspicion of Claudia Lawrence's murder. And police then go and search another three separate properties in and around Hayworth. We get to the 8th of March 2016 and obviously all of this evidence has been presented to the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, to see whether they feel that a trial can occur. And basically the CPS refuse to pursue a case submitted by the police against those four men. Obviously they had been arrested on suspicion of murder, but the CPS said that they didn't feel it could go to trial. They cited a lack of evidence as regards them stacking up to be the potential killers that the police are suggesting they are. The reason that they were suspects I can garner is because they'd all been regular customers of the Nags Head. Every single one of them denied any involvement in Claudia's disappearance, but you would, wouldn't you? Wouldn't be like, Oh God, you've arrested me, I did it all. So it's not unusual the suspects say that they're innocent, but equally the CPS obviously didn't feel that the evidence was sufficient. Won't be the first time the CPS have missed opportunities to take perpetrators and actually have them tried preventing any further harm. Think about Gary Allen case, which I've covered a serial killer who the CPS really allowed to walk free even though it was banged to rights as far as him being guilty for killing Samantha Class and yet somehow this guy time and time again got away with it. If you haven't seen my Gary Allen video please do. I actually work with the undercover who literally got his confession these days so I am in contact with the serial killer's undercover copper who is just absolutely incredible. In fact I've got a podcast coming out later in the year called Undercover with him. But that's by the by, I digress, I digress. Anyway, at this point, the police are really struggling because what they're saying is we don't have cooperation for witnesses, people aren't giving us what we need. And that second investigation basically ended after achieving very little. Now in August and September of 2021, the police went and searched sand, hut and gravel pits. That's a wooded area about eight miles northeast of York city center. And the reason they did this was there'd been some new evidence, but the police wouldn't say what the new evidence was. But land that had been used as fishing ponds since 1969 was basically drained. They drained one of the lakes on the site, and then they did a fingertip examination of the lake's bed. So we're talking that they are really committed to finding Claudia's killer. Don't get me wrong, it was a lackluster start to this investigation, but certainly 2021... And they're still going ahead and doing fingertip searches. So there's a deep commitment there. They also use this ground penetrating radar equipment and cadaver dogs to see whether they could turn anything up. And sadly, nothing was found, which must have been deeply upsetting. And also, it's expensive, isn't it? Now, there has been some allegations that Claudia Lawrence could have been killed by Christopher Halliwell. So in 2017, Stephen Fulcher, who's a senior investigating officer in the murder of Shan O'Callaghan, he published this book in which he suggested there were similarities in the case that he investigated with Claudia Lawrence's disappearance. Now, O'Callaghan, she left a Swindon nightclub around 3 a.m. She began the 20 minute walk back to her home. Then this licensed taxi, which was driven by Christopher Halliwell, he pulled up beside her. She accepted his offer to drive her home. And instead, this horrific 
heinous human being had driven her to this secluded place where he'd murdered her and then hid her body. And I guess it is notable to some degree that O'Callaghan was murdered by Halliwell on the 19th of March 2011. And he did get convicted of two murders, but he has been linked to numerous other violent offences against women, including assaults, rapes, disappearances, murders. So, like, certainly he's got the MO for it. And the date, 19th of March, does feature in a number of these cases. So think about it as a signature. When somebody has a pattern to their behaviour, we consider that a signature. It doesn't have to be physical. You don't have to think about BTK in the calling card he's leave. That's a physical signature. That's a, I did this, this is my work here, you know, because I've left this. But the psychological gratification that somebody receives can be about sticking to patterns. So the 19th of March features because people believe that there is some significance for Halliwell in that date. Now, in 2009, Halliwell was actually living in Swindon, Wiltshire, which is a long way away from Yorkshire. And this is where the two murders of which he was convicted occurred. So North Yorkshire Police, they said that, yeah, we have worked with the Wiltshire Police Force since September 2016, when that initial connection was made. But Detective Superintendent Wayne Fox, who's head of the major investigation team, stated, quote, the results of those inquiries, which included examinations of digital devices and the interviewing of several witnesses, indicated that Halliwell continued to operate as a taxi driver in the Swindon area within the relevant time parameters and therefore concluded it was unlikely that Halliwell was involved. Also, I think we always like to neatly package these scenarios where there is a solved case, right? Because it makes us feel safer. But just because you capture one serial killer, and serial killers we know are rare, that doesn't mean that there is not a serial killer or a murderer out there who is operating in a completely different time zone and period to the individual that's being considered as the potential suspect. The reality is we don't like to acknowledge that there are these horrible human predators who are out there and are too clever to get caught, but there are. Thousands of people disappear every year in the UK. Tens of thousands in other countries. And no one ever finds out where they went. The idea that they just reinvented themselves and they're living a completely different life elsewhere, just BS. When you never find a sign of life, that's because rarely is there a sign of life. And that's because I hate to say it, they are dead and something horrible has happened to them. I often think that my mindset is very different to a lot of other people's mindsets because of my experiences. I've worked with high sexual trauma, I've worked with sex trafficking. I sadly know that paedophiles and child molesters and murderers exist. I have endured the pain with my clients when helping them to try to move through some of the agony they've endured. I have heard about the horror that happens behind closed doors. I am not naive enough to believe that people just disappear and they're just happily getting on with their own life elsewhere. I know the horrors that are out there, I know. And it makes us feel afraid when we consider that and I get that. And like I said, my professional experience and privilege has been to work with people in certain scenarios that many of you would never even envisage could happen, but they happen. So when I hear about somebody like Claudia going missing in this way, I know that human predators who are very clever, very organized, sometimes working with others, find ways to make human beings disappear after they've done whatever it was they intended to do with them. Now, Joan Lawrence, that's Claudia's mother, she says, listen, police are blinkered that there were three apparent witnesses who can link Halliwell to North Yorkshire. Apparently, he got some family links there. She said to the Mirror newspaper, more and more people keep coming forward. This can't just be a coincidence. It just feels like there is something we're all missing. Surely, police should be looking at this again. She actually said that she'd been personally contacted by a woman who saw Halliwell's mugshot in the news and believed that she saw him in a red Range Rover near the Nestle factory at 5 a.m. in March 2009. By the way, the factory is in Haxby, which is just next to Hayworth. She said the way he looked at her frightened her so much that she ran home. I hope that it was somebody genuinely scary and not just some innocent guy just in his car just going about his business and some woman so judgy looked at him and had to run home because there was something so unattractive about him but what the mother is saying here is okay it might seem weird that Halliwell could be responsible but is it not possible that we revisit that and question him further and also look at the potential links and I get it as a mother I'd want to do that you don't want to leave 
any stone unturned. But like I've said, the police do not feel that that is a serious link. Apparently, that witness as well did speak to the police to say they'd been this guy who terrified her, but apparently they didn't take her very seriously. Joan Lawrence also actually asked the police whether she could get a look at what she referred to as Halliwell's treasure trove. So these were items that were linked to his crimes that were found in the lake in Ramsbury in 2014. It included one of the boots of one of his victims, a shotgun. It included women's clothing. And she said, please show me Halliwell's treasure trove. I might recognize something of Claudia's that could just be vital. Also, another witness came forward and said, that they did feel that they'd seen the rucksack that Claudia had been wearing the day that they believed that she went missing. So even though they didn't have evidence she was definitely wearing that or that she had left the home, they imagined that she'd taken a route to work and that's where she'd been abducted and she would have had the actual carrier on her back because it had the whites that she wore for being a chef and somebody saw a discarded or a lost rucksack on the path that she usually took but it feels like that's been lost in translation somewhere and arguably that would mean that it did strongly evidence that Claudia had been intercepted and harmed on her way to work. In 2020 her mum said still I don't know where my daughter is I don't even know if there is a grave somewhere it plays on my mind that her body is out there. On the 8th of November last year, 2023, Claudia's case was included in a Channel 5 documentary, Vanished, the search for Britain's missing. Former police inspector Martin Holloran, so he's now a visiting lecturer at Leeds Trinity University, he says, I genuinely believe that the case will be resolved. He said, because there was no damage in the house, because the pack pack was taken with the normal working clothes, my hypothesis, having looked at what's available, would suggest somebody has picked her up on the Thursday morning. He also noted that a witness that saw a male and female arguing by a car at 6.10 a.m. on the Thursday the 19th and saw that the passenger door was open, he believes that's a significant piece of evidence that this argument that was taking place could relate directly to Claudia being taken and indeed harmed. Now, one of the things I said that's really sad is that Peter, Claudia's father, died. So in 2021, he sadly passed away, and that means that he's never had the resolve of his daughter's disappearance. He doesn't know what happened to her, although he strongly believes that she was murdered. So when she initially went missing, her father really struggled. And bear in mind, he's a solicitor. He found it really challenging to take over her financial assets. She had a home, she had banks, etc. So one of the big issues was that they weren't able to sell her house. And bear in mind, there is a house, there is a mortgage. The fees are starting to build up and we all know what happens then. If you fail to pay for your mortgage on a monthly basis, it builds up to a point where they will basically take your home off you. But when you're a missing person, it's not fair to do that. You're not failing to pay, you can't pay. You don't have the opportunity to pay. And you're essentially being prejudiced against because you're a victim of a crime in this case. And he was like, this is a black hole. Can't just be happening to us. There has to be other missing people around the country that this is happening to. So Peter, who was, as I said, a solicitor, he started really heavily to campaign. He wanted the law to be modified. He said there was literally no mechanism to deal with financial affairs of a missing person unless they were declared dead under the presumption of death act that was brought in in 2013. And this would only be applied after someone had been missing for seven years. So you just have to imagine how horrific that would be with a family. You know, there's a house and a mortgage that you either have to pay on it or that you can't pay so it's repossessed. And you've got seven years of that. So Peter Lawrence, who, as I said, was a solicitor, he wanted that law to be modified, and rightly so, because he said there was literally no mechanism to deal with financial affairs of a missing person unless they happened to have been declared dead. So that's under the presumption of Death Act 2013. And for that to be applied, somebody had to be missing for seven years. Seven years. So you're either paying that mortgage for that period of time or you're accepting that that house is likely going to be repossessed, which is grossly unfair. So... The Guardianship, so basically Missing Persons Act, was passed into Parliament in 2017. It came into force in July 2019, and this allows for the family of a missing person to apply to the court for guardianship of that person's estate 
90 days after their disappearance. And that new law popularly became known as Claudia's Law. Like I said, even though Peter Lawrence died in February 2021 without ever finding out what happened to his daughter, he was so proud. And he was so grateful that the MP who was very much behind getting that legislation passed referred to it as Claudia's Law. Because it means that Claudia lives on in every family who has to endure a missing person who they love. Because if they have a home, etc., they will be able to take guardianship of that home and deal with the financial issues and affairs because of Claudia Lawrence's disappearance and indeed because of the love that Peter Lawrence clearly had for his daughter. I have no doubt whatsoever that Peter and Claudia are reunited. I'm sure he has all the answers that he ever needed, but he's left a legacy for her and a legacy for so many in her name on this earth and in the UK. And that makes a difference to everybody who has to go through something as awful as somebody going missing in their family, particularly when that person is missing, presumed murdered. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about an unsolved case where the individual responsible could still be out there. But the individual who stole this woman with potential's life from beneath her feet. She was just walking to work or indeed in the comfort of her own home and somebody decided that they could selfishly steal her life. And not having the closure for the family is just devastating. I hope that Claudia Lawrence's murderer knows it's coming for him. Time is coming for him. Because with every DNA advancement, with every stone that is unturned eventually through cold cases, through armchair detectives, through people falling out of alliance with individuals they know things about, where people's conscience pricks down the line, all of these mean that that person isn't free. They're free for now, and they've got away with the time that's passed between Claudia's disappearances and today, but it's coming for them, just like a monkey on their back. They know it. We know it. And somewhere in this universe, Claudia and Peter know it. That time can't come quickly enough. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case. It's frustrating because Claudia hasn't had the closure and resolve that she deserves. And whilst we can never let go of the loss of somebody that we love, at least understanding what happened can give us a sense of completion as far as the story is concerned. If you've seen this cover before and you know extra information, please let me know. If you know the person responsible for Claudia Lawrence's disappearance, let the police know. Make a difference in this world. And if you do happen to be the murderer of Claudia Lawrence and you just can't help forensically watch this kind of information because it's about you and you know it's about you, well, enjoy your breaths of freedom because it won't last forever then that will eventually close in. Take care, guys. Be safe.